Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Catherine McLean, a tobacco control researcher at Temple University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Mike Pasco at Georgia State University, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, and Justin White at the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccotechpolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. We would like to inform the audience, we will soon be selecting presentations for the fall season. Please contact the organizer if you have any questions and submit your research by Sunday, September 26, 2021. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pascoe at Georgia State University to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Jamie Hartman Boyce will lead a workshop presentation entitled Cochrane Living Systematic Review of E-Cigarettes for Smoking Cessation. Dr. Hartman Boyce is an associate professor in the Nutfield Department of Primary Care Health Sciences, University of Oxford, where she directs the evidence-based healthcare PhD program and leads evidence synthesis research programs. She is an editor of the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Review Group and frequently authors Cochrane Reviews. She leads the Cancer Research UK-funded Cochrane Living Systematic Review of Electronic Cigarettes for Smoking Cessation. Our discussant today is Justin White. Dr. Harmon Boyce will be presenting her research in two segments. We will have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Harmon Boyce, thank you for presenting for us today. Great, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm just gonna share my screen. And I'm assuming you can all see that. If I'm assuming incorrectly, please obviously do yes. let me know. Great. So I'm an associate professor at the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, and I work really closely with the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group at the University of Oxford. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a review of electronic cigarettes for smoking cessation. And the first half will mainly focus on the methods we use, then pause for questions, and then talk through the results of the most recent update. So in terms of the acknowledgements, this review itself is currently funded by Cancer Research UK, but we also receive support from the National Institute of Health Research, which is essentially um, the research arm of our government national health service. I've also received funding from the British Heart Foundation, Cochrane and the University of Oxford. I don't have any industry funding uh, or any conflicts of interest to declare. And the most important acknowledgement for this work is just our brilliant author team. Some of you will recognize some of the faces here who are involved in this review, which is no small undertaking. So very grateful to them and all of their contributions previously and still ongoing. For those of you not familiar with it, Cochrane is a global nonprofit. So it is split into over 50 specific review groups, which deal with different topics. So the review group I deal with is the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Review Group, which is based at Oxford. And Cochrane exists really to help people make decisions and have the best available evidence to hand when they're making those decisions. And we do this by gathering and combining the best evidence from research to determine benefits and risks of healthcare treatments and interventions. We do this through creating systematic reviews with a really strong evidence on quality assessment. So it's not just what does the evidence show, but also how much can we trust the evidence in front of us. Cochrane methods are broadly considered gold standard. We follow a very rigorous set of methods is published in a handbook, which is hundreds of pages long. And as a result, our Cochrane reviews are often hundreds of pages long. So sometimes they're not the most accessible documents, but we like to think they're quite useful. And they're used worldwide by people making healthcare decisions. So that might be clinicians. Increasingly, they're also used by patients and members of the public. Cochrane has made more of an effort to be a bit more accessible. So we now, for example, have plain language summaries for all of our briefings that are translated into lots of different languages. And our reviews in the tobacco addiction group tend to be used a lot for healthcare policy. So this review of the electronic cigarettes has made it into a lot of national and international guidelines, but also our reviews of, for example, nicotine replacement therapy have been used for years 
including um, our review being one of the big bits of evidence for nicotine replacement therapy that got it on the WHO's list of essential medications. So we exist really to do these reviews to make sure that when policymakers are making decisions, they don't have to go through and read every single paper ever published and appraise it. Hopefully what we're doing is we're bringing all that evidence together in a transparent way. And transparency is really key there. We're not saying that everyone might agree with our methods, but what we hope is someone could read our paper and know exactly what we did and why we did it. And then they could make their own judgments if they disagreed with the way that we assessed our evidence. So Cochrane reviews tend to not be static documents. Our Cochrane Review of Electronic Cigarettes for Smoking Cessation was first published in 2014, and the objective is to evaluate the safety and the effect of using e-cigarettes to help people who smoke achieve long-term smoking abstinence. So after first publishing the review in 2014, we then published it again in 2016 with updated evidence, then again in 2020. And that gap between 2016 and 2020 was quite an active time in the field of e-cigarette research. So it really kind of pained us that the review was quite out of date and it was still being cited in guidelines, even though we hadn't updated it for three years. And so at that point, we applied for funding from Cancer Research UK to turn it into a living systematic review for a couple of years. So that's how it exists now. And a living systematic review basically means that our team searches for new evidence monthly. We search databases, we search unpublished records, we screen conference abstracts, et cetera. Any new studies we find that are relevant to our question will publish links to monthly so everyone can see that. And we update the full review and new data emerges that in any way might change the way someone read the review. So that means if it changes, strengthens, or weakens our existing conclusions, or quite crucially in this area, if it relates to new comparisons or new outcomes. This is such an emerging field of research that we have new studies looking at things that no other studies have looked at before regularly coming out. So we trigger updates to the review every time that happens. Also as part of this living systematic review process, we try to have a real focus on dissemination. These are really long documents. No one is gonna read them from start to finish for the most part. So we produce briefing documents for members of the public, particularly for people who smoke who might be interested in switching to e-cigarettes, for policymakers and clinicians, and also um, for anyone who is really into e-cigarette research. My colleague, Dr. Nicola Linson and I produce a monthly podcast where we just talk about the new studies that we've found. And most of the time try to interview someone who's published one of these studies to really get a range of opinions and information on the research that's coming out at the moment. So as part of this living systematic review process, we published an update in 2020. We then published another one in April 2021 and our most recent update came out on Tuesday of this week. So it's good timing to be presenting results from that because they are literally hot off the press. So that review update published earlier this week, it involves searches up to the 1st of May 2021. And we had five new included studies since our April review. So in terms of what we look at in our review, uh, when we go back to originally when we planned this review, so we, we published this protocol in 2012 and published the first review in 2014, we were interested in three types of studies. We were interested in randomized controlled trials in which people who smoked were randomized to some sort of e-cigarette intervention or a control condition of any sort in uncontrolled intervention studies in which all people in the study were offered e-cigarettes and in longitudinal surveys. So those were studies where no intervention was offered. They surveyed people who smoked, asked them if they used e-cigarettes and then followed up those people a certain time period later to see if they were still using e-cigarettes and still smoking. And from the start, there've been two main outcomes we've been interested in. And this follows really standard process for our groups when we're evaluating cessation interventions. We're interested in smoking cessation at six months or longer, and we're interested in any measures of harm at a week or longer of use. Now, typically, Cochrane reviews of interventions actually only include randomized controlled trials. If anyone's familiar with the pyramid of evidence or the evidence hierarchy for testing interventions, randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials often sit at the top. But because this is such a new research area, we knew that especially in terms of harms data, and rare harms. We just weren't going to get very much from randomized controlled trials because there weren't that many out there. And that's why we started with these studies. And in our 2016 review, we signaled that we were going to be moving forward. So from the 2020 review on review onwards, 
dropping those longitudinal surveys, those purely observational studies. So that was because of the nature of the design and the risk of confounding. And I'll go on to talk about that decision in a little bit more detail. Because one of the interesting things in this area is that not always, but the randomized controlled trials tend to find something slightly different from the observational studies. And there are a number of reasons that might be. So in our September update, we ended up with 61 studies. 34 of those were randomized controlled trials. And we we're looking at data from just under 17,000 participants. So why might the randomized controlled trials provide different answers than the observational studies? Why does Cochrane focus on randomized controlled trials? Why do we focus on that data in our review? There are lots of different reasons. I won't go through all of them. Some of the really key ones, I think, that might be driving a lot of the differences we're seeing is, first of all, there are variations in the effectiveness of e-cigarettes, we think, depending on the level of support provided. So particularly in the early randomized controlled trials of e-cigarettes, what we often saw with the, these were kind of researcher led, there was a lot of input, a lot of behavioral support provided, a lot of instruction about how to best use e-cigarettes to quit smoking. As time has emerged, more and more trials have come out which are integrating e-cigarettes into stop smoking services. So here in the UK, we've had trials where basically it's one of the things that might be offered when you go see someone for support to quit smoking. So that's a little bit more real world, but it's still, of course, a different level of support than someone who might be buying one from a shop and not receiving any support at all. One of the issues we also have with the observational studies in this area, particularly with the earlier ones, were issues around the definitions of baseline electronic cigarette usage. So some of the studies which looked at this said we're interested in regular vaping. So let's say using a nicotine cigarette at least five days a week for the last month. Other studies would say, have you ever in your life had even a puff of an e-cigarette? And obviously those are two very different things. One of the nice things about studies of interventions is that at least you know everyone's receiving the same advice. They might not be using the device in the same way and in the way that, that they're prescribed it, but they're given the same advice for how to use it. Of course, and key to issues with observational studies anyways, and why when we look at interventions, we want to use randomized controlled trials if we can, is the issue of unexplored confounders. This is not at all specific to e-cigarettes. It's not at all specific to, to tobacco smoking. It goes, of course, throughout the observational evidence. We know that correlation doesn't always mean causation. And if you look at analyses of people using nicotine replacement therapy, we have over a hundred randomized controlled trials that provide very high certainty, consistent evidence that giving people nicotine replacement therapy can boost their chances of successfully quitting. But if you looked at the observational data and you didn't control for confounders, you'd actually probably see the opposite. So people, if you survey people who smoke and you compare those who say they're using nicotine replacement therapy to those who aren't, and you then follow them up, let's say six months later, it's often more likely that the people using nicotine replacement therapy are still smoking it than the people who weren't using it. That doesn't mean nicotine replacement therapy doesn't work. It's because there's something different about the people using nicotine replacement therapy that make them both more likely to use the nicotine replacement therapy and more likely to struggle to quit smoking. And typically that's that they're more addicted and possibly that they've tried to quit smoking in the past using other methods and not been successful. And also critical to this area, is the issue that studies which analyze the results in people who smoke at baseline and base that on e-cigarette usage at baseline have by the nature of the design already excluded people who have successfully quit using e-cigarettes. So if we imagine an observational study and we have people who decide to try switching to e-cigarettes as a way to quit smoking, those who have successfully done that at the time that a researcher calls up and says, might you wanna be in this study? will say they're no longer smoking because they've successfully switched over and therefore wouldn't be eligible to be included in the study, whereas those who are using e-cigarettes and still smoking would be eligible to be included. So in that sense, these studies have an issue where at baseline they're retaining participants who at entrance of the study might be classified as treatment failures if we think of e-cigarettes as a way to get people off smoking or might be in the midst of a cessation attempt involving cutting down to quit. So for those reasons, and following the standard methods of the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group, and also our protocol for this review, we focus on the evidence from randomized controlled trials, especially when we're looking at cessation outcomes. So in terms of what we're looking at in this review, we are very specifically in this review interested in the use of e-cigarettes to facilitate quitting smoking. So the question of e-cigarettes in former smokers, 
in non-smokers is not something that's in scope here. We are here looking at e-cigarettes as a quitting aid. So we're interested in studies that enroll people defined as current smokers, whether or not they're motivated or unmotivated to quit at the start of these studies. This review now involves quite a few comparisons, but the ones that we focus on the most when we disseminate the results and the ones I'll talk through in the second half of this workshop are those comparing nicotine e-cigarettes to nicotine replacement therapy, nicotine e-cigarettes compared to behavioral support only or no support. And by that, I don't mean studies which are head-to-head -head comparisons of nicotine e-cigarettes and nothing else versus counseling and nothing else. What I mean are studies where everyone, let's say, receives counseling and one arm also receives nicotine e-cigarettes. And finally, looking at nicotine e-cigarettes versus non-nicotine e-cigarettes, which are sometimes referred to as placebo e-cigarettes, um, but we prefer the non-nicotine terminology just because to give some background on why cessation researchers in, in the UK in particular were possibly excited about e-cigarettes to start with, we know that most people who smoke in the UK and indeed in the US want to quit smoking. We also know that for most of them, when they try to quit in any given quit attempt, they won't be successful. And that's the case even if they're using the best available treatments, combinations of frontline pharmacotherapies and behavioral support. So we know that there's space, there's a need for better ways to help people quit smoking. And it was thought when nicotine e-cigarettes came on the market that it might be a way because not only are they providing nicotine in the same way nicotine replacement therapy does, but unlike nicotine replacement therapy, they might also be addressing some of these behavioral, psychological, and social cues that we know are so critical to nicotine and cigarette addiction that hadn't really been addressed by previous quit aids. And so when we're looking at nicotine e-cigarettes versus nicotine replacement therapy, one way to think about is that is that we're really isolating the effect of those behavioral, social, and psychological cues that might come from using an e-cigarette. When we're looking at a nicotine e-cigarette versus a non-nicotine e-cigarette, we're really isolating the nicotine delivery via that device. And when we compare it to behavioral support only or no support, we're looking at the device as a whole. In terms of our outcomes, our primary outcomes are cessation adverse events and serious adverse events. For cessation, we follow very standard methods for our group, which means that we only look at cessation at six months or longer because unfortunately we know the relapse curve is so steep in the first six months after quitting smoking. We use the strictest definition of abstinence available. So if we have continuous and point prevalence, we choose continuous. If we have biochemically validated and self-reported, we choose biochemically validated. And we also use an intention to treat model where we assume that anyone who hasn't been followed up is a continuing smoker. And again, that's fairly common in the field. For adverse events and serious adverse events, we use the definitions, which are very common across all medical literature um, and are interested in these at a week or longer of e-cigarette use. We also look at changes in relevant biomarkers. I won't have time to talk through those in the presentation, but we look at things like known carcinogens and toxicants, exhaled carbon monoxide, various measures of lung function and blood oxygen. And one of the nice things about doing this as a living systematic review is that after we published our October review, we got a number of inquiries from policy makers throughout the world really, so from more than one country, saying, do you look at how many people are still using e-cigarettes at the end of the studies? And that wasn't something we'd looked at previously, but we thought this is coming from multiple areas. It's clearly an area of interest. So in this September version of the review, we also added a new outcome looking at product use at six months or longer. So that's the proportion of participants who are assigned a certain product, let's say nicotine e-cigarettes or nicotine replacement therapy, who are still using that at the longest follow-up. So that's been a nice way that this living systematic review format allows us to be a bit more responsive to the needs of policymakers. In terms of our searches, as I said, this review that I'm talking about now covers studies found to May 2021. We searched seven electronic databases. We looked through all the abstracts from SRNT. We contact researchers in the field. We also go through trial registries, other conference abstracts, and anything we can to try and find ongoing studies and keep a log of those as well. And anytime we go to update the review, if we have our log of ongoing studies and we haven't found a study published yet, but it should have been, we email those authors and we say, do you have results? Can you share them? And if, if you're on this call, chances are we might've sent you one of those emails and massive thanks for responding to it. Now, in terms of numerical analyses, systematic reviews often, they don't always, but they often include meta-analyses, which is where we bring together the results from individual studies and pool them where appropriate. And here we have standard Cochrane methods that we use. We conduct meta 
analyses using a fixed effect mental Hansel model. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. Um, and we calculate risk ratios with 95% confidence intervals for each studies, and those then bring those together into pooled estimates where appropriate. So what that means for anyone who, who isn't familiar with risk ratios is basically we're looking at for cessation, the number of people who quit in the intervention group over the number of people in the intervention group, and then divide that by the number of people who quit in the control group and the number of people in a control group. So for cessation, which is an outcome we want, we want to see risk ratios greater than one. If we're looking at a new intervention, that means it's working better than the control condition. If we're looking at serious adverse events, we want to see risk ratios less than one because that means fewer serious adverse events are occurring. And because it's a ratio, one means no difference between the two arms in whatever outcome we're measuring. So what I have here is just a very simple example of a forest plot, which is the graphical representation of the results from a meta-analysis. So just quickly to talk you through it here, what we have down at the bottom is the total number of events. So in this case, the total number of people who quit smoking across the studies. This line in the middle here is the line of no effects. So that represents a risk ratio of one. And what you see here, each of these lines is an individual study. The lines around those blue dots are the confidence intervals for that study. And if you look at that diamond at the bottom, that represents the point estimates, the pooled estimate from all of those studies. And the horizontal edges of that diamond are the confidence intervals. So one quick way to look at a forest plot and see if a result is statistically significant is to see if those confidence intervals are crossing the line of no effect. When we're doing a meta-analysis, we're also interested in how similar the studies are. And there are a couple of different ways to look at that. In Cochrane, we use something called the I-squared statistics. So we know that studies are done in people. There's an element of chance. We don't expect all studies, especially if they're small, to find the exact same thing. But what the I-squared statistic does is it estimates the degree of the differences with, between the studies that's more than we'd expect from chance alone. So in this analysis, it's 0%. We aren't seeing more difference than we'd expect from chance alone. And we can also know that because we see that the confidence intervals for our individual studies overlap quite clearly. So when we do a meta-analysis for a primary outcome, one of the things we do in Cochrane that is also done by many other journals and by guideline developers is we assess how certain we are in the evidence. And we do that using a Thing called grade, which many of you might have heard of, where we basically consider different domains that would make us less certain about the evidence, less trusting that the result we found was actually representative of the true result. The first of those is risk of bias. So we think about as review authors, we go through each study and we follow a Cochrane risk of bias tool to see if we trust the study results. And if we have lots of studies that we're judging at high risk of bias, and particularly if our results are sensitive to the inclusion of those studies, so if those high risk of bias studies are driving our effects, for example, then we're going to be less certain in our evidence. We look at inconsistency, which are differences between the results of individual studies, and that's that heterogeneity concept that I just showed you on the last slide with our I squared of zero present there and our overlapping confidence intervals suggesting no inconsistency. Sometimes inconsistency is there and is explained, in which case that's fine if we know what's causing it. But often we'll have a case where we don't know why we're seeing different results between studies, and that would lead to a lot of uncertainty about the underlying effect. If different studies are finding different things, we don't know why, then we're going to be less certain in the results of our meta-analysis. We're interested in indirectness, and here this is an issue if head-to-head -head comparisons aren't available. So let's say you were a stop smoking advisor, you had someone sitting in front of you saying, should I use a nicotine e-cigarette or nicotine replacement therapy? And there were no studies directly comparing the two. All you had was studies of nicotine replacement therapy versus control and e-cigarettes versus control. You'd be relying on indirect evidence. Here, another really relevant bit where indirectness creeps in, and this is specific to e-cigarettes in this case, is the device type. So we know that e-cigarette technology is evolving very quickly. We know that traditionally randomized controlled trials take a very long time to get funded, get off the ground, get completed, and then get reported. And what we found certainly in earlier versions of this review is that by the time our review was published, the studies that contributed to our review used e-cigarette devices that were no longer available on the market. So when we first published, we had two big randomized controlled trials, not that big, but big enough that were contributing to our primary outcomes. And for both of those, 
the device that they used was no longer available to people by the time their studies were published. And that's because the devices weren't very good at delivering nicotine. And so they've been withdrawn from the market and replaced with products that delivered nicotine more effectively. So that meant that actually for someone who was thinking about whether or not to use a nicotine e cigarette to quit smoking, if they could never purchase a product like that anyways, because product technology had moved on so much, how relevant were our results? In recent years, results, I think for e-cigarette studies have come out more quickly. That's partly because of better reporting structures. It's also, I think that studies are um, being funded possibly a little bit more easily as more and more research comes out in this area. So we now do have evidence for more up-to-date devices, which is great. Imprecision is an issue when we don't have enough studies or the studies that we have aren't very big. So as a rule of thumb, if we have a meta-analysis and the total number of events is less than 300, so in the case of smoking cessation, if fewer than 300 people have quit smoking, then we're gonna be really a little bit worried about imprecision. And that, that's also an issue when we have wide confidence intervals is another way to think about it. If results are imprecise, if we only have a few studies, they don't have that many events, that means that a new study could come along and massively change the results from our meta-analysis, especially if it found something different and it was a large study. And finally, something that we need to consider with all systematic reviews, but that I consider one of the more intractable issues is publication bias. So this is particularly an issue when you have industry funding of studies. And there is obviously, if an industry invests in a device and then does a study of it, and that study finds that the device works brilliantly and is really safe and effective, that study is likely to be published very quickly, very clearly. Systematic review authors are likely to get their hands on it very quickly. If that study doesn't find that, if it finds the device maybe isn't better than what's currently on the market, then those study results are likely to either not come out or take a lot more time to come out. So that's something that we have very statistical means to test for, but that only works if we have a bunch of studies. Um, and it's something that's very hard to rule out, but it's why we kind of so obsessively try to sift through trial registries and find unpublished evidence. So I will pause there for any questions about our methods before I go on and discuss our results. Okay, thank you. Please add your questions to the Q&A. Uh, for the time being though, I will um, ask Justin if he has any discussion comments. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a couple methodological questions as somebody who does not do meta-analyses. Um, so, and one is actually overlaps with uh, one in the um, Q&A as well. So your meta-analyses, and I think maybe all the ones from the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group use a fixed effects model, which I understand assumes all studies share a common effect size as opposed to a random effects model that assumes there's sort of this distribution of different effect sizes. And I was wondering if you could explain why you or, or your group more generally sort of makes that design choice. <clears throat> and also, in, in this case in particular, I would expect that there might be a distribution of possible effects because of you know, variation in e-cigarette interventions across studies in particular, and maybe the uh, participant, mi participant mix. So, um, and I should also point out that the, the term fixed effects here is different from how economists usually use it, so. Um. Yeah, totally different, yeah. Great question. Um, so historically, if we go back to kind of the 1990s when our group started, we did always use fixed effects models. And the reason for that was that random effects models don't cope very well or at all if you have studies where either arm has no events or indeed they don't cope that great if you have low event numbers. So if you have a study where two people quit, that's not, that's not excellent in a random effects model. As time went on, obviously we got a lot more data in our reviews. So we took the decision as a group, I wanna say four or five years ago, that for any sort of behavioral intervention, we now fool using a random effects model because there's really, it would be very difficult to argue that every form of counseling, for example, is gonna have the same, same effect. What we've done for our pharmacotherapy reviews is stick with the fixed effect model for the reason that if you're receiving a common dosage of something like nicotine replacement therapy, there is reason to suspect fixed effect. And there are some downsides to random effects. And one of the biggest downsides to random effects is that it gives typically more weight to small studies. So let's say you have 10 studies, a couple of them are tiny, a couple of them are really big. They'll all be treated much more equally in the meta-analysis if it's a random effects. And we know that smaller studies tend to be um, typically 
uh, prone to a bit more bias and certainly prone to more publication bias. So if it's a really big study, it's likely to be published regardless. If it's a small study, it's much more likely to be published to find something exciting. So kind of weighing the benefits and disadvantages. And we did go back and forth on whether to use random or fixed effects in this particular review. Um, in the end, our decision to stick with fixed effects was guided by two things. One was a concern about giving too much emphasis on small studies, particularly where publication bias might be an issue. But the other one, and, and probably the guiding principle when we've been doing this review, is wanting to be consistent with our other reviews of pharmacotherapies. So, you know, when we do our reviews, because they're so frequently used by, for example, guideline developers, the reviews often don't exist on their own. People are looking at our review of nicotine replacement therapy, our review of antidepressants, our review of nicotine receptor partial agonists, and our review of e-cigarettes. And we kind of felt like using consistent methods across that would be the clearest way to approach it. And we didn't kind of want to um, muddy the waters and have a situation where people weren't comparing like with like. But it is a good question, and we did actually have a lot of discussion about whether to use random or fixed effects in this particular review. It might be that as more studies emerge, um, and we have more big studies, that that we move over to a random effects model that can cope with with those studies better. Thank you. Um, that's that's really helpful. So after you assess risk of bias and other grade dimensions by study, how do you aggregate those across studies? Because obviously studies are going to differ in the risk of bias. And you know, if you have some high risk studies, um, some low risk, how, how do you sort of make an overall determination? Yeah, so what we do with risk of bias is we do something called a sensitivity analysis, where we're looking at whether or not our results are sensitive to the inclusion of studies at high risk of bias or an unclear risk of bias. So let's say we have a meta-analysis with five studies. And three of them we've judged to be at low risk of bias, and two of them we've judged to be at high or unclear risk of bias. What we do there is we'd pull them all together, look at the result, and then we'd remove those studies that we we're less sure about from our analysis, and we'd compare the results from the two. And if the kind of direction of effect was the same, the confidence intervals were relatively similar, there was no difference in the heterogeneity, We'd say, you know, even if we didn't include those studies that we think we don't trust quite as much, it wouldn't change our overall message. So there we wouldn't downgrade according to grade standards. Um, if we're looking at body, body of evidence, all the studies were at higher unclear risk of bias, then we'd definitely be worried about risk of bias. And similarly, which has definitely happened in some of our other reviews, we found that our results are sensitive to the inclusion of studies at high risk of bias. So we might find an effect estimate that shows that a certain treatment works, but then you remove the high risk of bias studies and all of a sudden that effect is much less clear. And that would also kind of limit our certainty in our results. And we think these might be affected by these high risk of bias studies. Great, and do I have time for one more, Mike, or should I? Sure. Um, so you mentioned that the review includes some uh, includes uncontrolled intervention studies. So just to clarify, your estimates for cessation, you said use RCTs only, but some of the other outcomes use uh, the uncontrolled studies. So I wanted to confirm that. And also, would that mean that if it was a non-randomized controlled study, that it would not be eligible to be included? So we, for our meta-analyses, we only include the results from randomized controlled trials. What we do is we report the findings, we tabulate them, and then we, we report them narratively for the uncontrolled intervention studies. For the cessation ones, we really don't pay much attention to that data, to be quite frank. But for the adverse events and the serious adverse events and the various changes in biomarkers, we do and we're interested in. So for the biomarkers, we'll compare before and after. Um, and for serious adverse events and adverse events, it's really trying to pick up on any signals that there are particular events that are related to the use of e-cigarettes. So we haven't picked up on any signals on serious adverse events, some big caveats around there and that we don't have that many studies and they don't follow up for that long. But in terms of adverse events, one of these things we can tell from these um, uncontrolled intervention studies is that people tend to get some irritation. So let's say throat and mouth irritation, nausea, headaches, that tends to dissipate over time when they start an e-cigarette intervention. And that's something that we can learn from those studies. So we're more interested in the safety outcomes from those studies. And in an ideal world, you'd have huge randomized controlled trials and you'd just rely on data for those for everything. But especially with rare adverse events, it's difficult to imagine that happening. If we had an 
non-randomized study, but there was an e-cigarette intervention in it, it was just that the groups weren't randomized, then we would still include that. We wouldn't include it in our meta-analyses, but we would include it in the review and report the results. However, if there wasn't an intervention, then we wouldn't include that study. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Okay, um, a few questions in the Q&A. Um, one is, is there uh, much variation in nicotine concentration in the e cigs in the many RCT studies? Uh, same question about flavors. Yeah, so in the nicotine concentration, there is. Um, and we now have a comparison which has results from studies which actually directly compare high versus low nicotine concentrations, which is great and really useful to look at. One of our plans that we kind of published in our protocol and one day plan to do when we have enough studies is do something called a subgroup analysis, where within our main meta-analysis, we subgroup the studies to see if differences between the studies are resulting in different effects. And one of the things we planned to do was nicotine concentration. But it's really tricky. First of all, we don't have enough studies to do that meaningfully at the moment. But also with e-cigarettes, we know that the nicotine concentration of the e-liquid is only one of the factors that relates to how much nicotine the user is actually getting into their system. Um, so I suspect by, when we come to doing these subgroup analyses in the future, where device types vary and the way the nicotine is delivered varies, it'll be very difficult to say if any pattern we're seeing is coming from the nicotine content. And for that reason, I much prefer these direct comparisons and trials where the device and everything about it is the same for both arms and one arm just has a higher nicotine concentration. Okay. Was there a second uh, part of the question that I missed? Um, uh, just nicotine concentration and flavors. Oh, flavors, yeah. So flavor-wise, we don't yet have any studies which are comparing between flavors. It would be really useful to have that. Of the studies we include, most of them give users some sort of choice, but very limited choice. So let's say between tobacco and menthol or maybe one fruit flavor. Um, so that is an area where currently we don't have direct comparisons, but we would like to see them. And we record all that information in our characteristics of included studies tables as well. Okay. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll read the question here. Uh, a major factor for the success of vaping is its adaptability to individual preferences. How does the Cochrane protocol handle the fact that the control part of RCTs often eliminate this? Yeah, excellent question. Um, we just decided, so there's an ongoing study that we found where participants in the intervention arm are essentially given a choice of things and e-cigarettes is one of them. Um, and we really, again, here as a team, we're back and forth, like, is this relevant to include? We wouldn't necessarily include it in some of our other reviews, but it felt like because of this choice element being important, that probably is something that we will look at, but we'll look at that separately. So we wouldn't include that in the same analysis saying, okay, one group is randomized to an e-cigarette and one group's randomized to nicotine replacement therapy and they don't have a choice. We'd include that in a new analysis saying, what does it mean to give participants a range of options where e-cigarettes is one of them? And then look at the results there. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and I know that you don't have uh, that much time. If I could just squeeze a question in quick. Um, you mentioned um, that you guys include the studies in which there's a, like an e-cigarette intervention, right? Um, and so a lot of economists, we think of our interventions as kind of policy shocks, right? Like if we have a tax, for example, that's affecting people's accessibility to these pro uh, products or other types of laws as well. Um, so would those types of interventions be useful then to Cochrane or uh, not? So not to this review, um, but they may well be to other reviews in the future. So what we're looking here at really kind of individual level interventions, the kind of thing that you might offer someone if they came into your clinic and was interested in quitting smoking. Um, so we're looking at those individual level instead of those kind of upper level tax availability marketing types of interventions, but increasingly Cochrane is developing methods for looking at those. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that okay. um, at the end. Okay, please first, please proceed. Great. Okay, just bring up my screen. So moving on to the results from this most recent update. So we have, as I mentioned earlier in this review now, 61 included studies. Five of those are new from April, 34 of them are randomized controlled trials and over 16,000 participants. 
In terms of our risk of bias rating, seven of them, we considered at low risk of bias overall, and all of those are randomized controlled trials which are contributing to our main comparisons. We considered 42 at high risk overall, and just to note that includes um, all of the non-randomized studies according to the Cochrane Risk of Bias Framework, non-randomized essentially equates to high risk, and the remainder of them were at unclear risk, and that's just where we don't have enough information to determine, and usually that's because we're looking at unpublished data from something like conference abstracts or results posted on clinical trial registries. When we looked at nicotine e-cigarettes versus nicotine replacement therapy, so I would argue here probably the comparison we're most interested in. Previously, we've been really interested in nicotine e-cigarettes versus placebo, but actually the reality is if someone comes into a clinic and is looking for support to stop smoking, they're not going to be sent away with nothing. They may well be sent away with something like nicotine replacement therapy. So we're really interested in the comparison there. And what we found was moderate certainty evidence that nicotine e-cigarettes lead to higher quit rates at six months or longer than nicotine replacement therapy. And the reason that's moderate certainty evidence and not high certainty evidence is imprecision. So we're in a situation here where the studies we have aren't particularly large. Unfortunately, quitting smoking successfully is rare. And so we have fewer than 300 events contributing to this meta-analysis. This might well change. So one of the exciting things about having it as a living systematic review is that a new study could come out soon, especially if it was well-powered, could really change this picture. If it found the same things as these other studies, it might get us to the point where we had high certainty evidence because we'd have yet another study contributing more data that was consistent. If it found the opposite, we might be in a situation where maybe imprecision wasn't so much of an issue, but all of a sudden we had a real issue with inconsistency if we have studies finding different things. So we are all I mean, we're all pretty geeky when we go through the evidence, but we're all really excited when we see new studies coming out, particularly that can contribute to analyses like these and going to change the picture moving forward. And one way to think of grade certainty is that when we say something is high certainty, it means that we think future studies are very unlikely to change our estimate of the effect. Anything that's not high certainty means that we think another study could come along and change what we think. When we compare nicotine e-cigarettes to nicotine replacement therapy and look at adverse events, very few studies gave data. Those that did found no difference. And here we had moderate certainty evidence of no difference. Again, an issue with imprecision. Same goes with serious adverse events. Here, very little data. Fortunately for study participants, serious adverse events are really rare, but of course that means our results are really imprecise and it's very difficult to see if any difference is happening due to chance or to a genuine difference between treatments. So again, no evidence of a difference, but very low certainty evidence here. And as I mentioned before, an important caveat around the studies in this review so far is that most of them are only looking up to six months or a year. The longest follow-up we have is two years. So moving on to looking at nicotine e-cigarettes versus non-nicotine e-cigarettes or placebo e-cigarettes as they're sometimes referred to. Here we had moderate certainty evidence of an increased quit rate in people using nicotine e-cigarettes. Um, I apologize because I think some of my forest plots have not been updated, but the moderate certainty evidence of a benefit still stands. I just think this might be missing one study. Um, so again, we're seeing the situation where we don't have many studies. They don't have that much data, but the data we do have is showing that e-cigarettes with nicotine are helping people quit smoking compared to non-nicotine e-cigarettes. Similarly, so for all the adverse events and serious adverse events data I'm presenting for the rest of this, we have low certainty evidence simply because we don't have that much data to hand. So here we have low certainty evidence of no difference. And same for serious adverse events. We only have one study here contributing data. So obviously we just need more studies to know what could be going on. And ideally more studies following up participants for a longer period of time as well. And finally, moving on to nicotine e-cigarettes versus behavioral support only or no support. Here we, unsurprisingly, I'd say based on the other review, other uh, comparisons, have evidence that shows that more people are quitting using nicotine e-cigarettes than behavioral support only or no support. Here, actually, our certainty in the evidence according to Cochrane and Grave Standards is very low, and that's because not only do we have this issue with imprecision, we don't have that many people quitting, we don't have that many studies. But also, according to Cochrane standards, these studies are all by their very nature at high risk of bias. And that's because participants are receiving differential levels of support and they're not blind to this. So 
when we're looking at nicotine e-cigarettes versus nicotine replacement therapy, both groups are receiving an active intervention. When we're looking at nicotine e-cigarettes versus non-nicotine e-cigarettes, traditionally participants are blinded. They both think they're receiving the same sort of support. Here, it's very clear that there's an imbalance. And so we don't know how much of the result is due to bias caused by the fact that one group is receiving a much more intensive intervention than the other group is receiving. But what I would say about this judgment is that if we think about nicotine e-cigarettes versus nicotine replacement therapy, isolating the behavioral, social, and, and psychological cues around smoking, we think of nicotine e-cigarettes versus non-nicotine e-cigarettes, isolating the e-cigarettes ability to deliver nicotine. If both of those show that e-cigarettes are increasing quitting, we'd kind of expect them to increase quitting against nothing. So just, just a note around the way the grade works there. For adverse events at a week or longer, we had some evidence of more adverse events in the nicotine e-cigarette arm. So these are non-serious adverse events um, than with behavioral support only or no support. But here again, very low certainty due to imprecision and that issue with these studies being at risk of bias according to Cochrane standards. And the same goes for serious adverse events. Here, no clear evidence of a difference, but the same issue with risk of bias and imprecision. Now, all Cochrane reviews end with implications for practice and implications for research. Within Cochrane, we very much view ourselves as pro-evidence rather than pro any sort of intervention or anti any sort of intervention. So our job is not to make recommendations for practice. It's not to tell people what to do. It's to say, this is what the evidence shows. And in this case, we have evidence suggesting nicotine e-cigarettes can aid in smoking cessation, which is consistent across several comparisons, moderate certainty evidence of benefit compared to nicotine replacement therapy and compared to non-nicotine replacement therapy. But as I mentioned, that issue with imprecision we just may need more evidence and very low certainty evidence that e-cigarettes with nicotine increased quit rates compared to behavioral support only or no support. We do have some studies, which I didn't present here. The full review is very long for anyone who wants to, to read it in full, which looked at the effect of nicotine e-cigarettes as an adjunct to NRT. So where both arms received nicotine replacement therapy and one arm also received nicotine e-cigarettes, but evidence there was unclear simply because we didn't have very much data at all. None of our included studies which as I said, we're in the short to midterm up to two years, detected any serious adverse cons events considered possibly related to e-cigarette use. Important to note the nature of this up to two years. Also really important to note that these are studies of regulated nicotine containing e-cigarettes. They're not studies of things that have been adulterated. They are studies that have gone through ethical committees and we know that not all e-cigarettes are the same. So what we're presenting here are the results of studies testing nicotine e-cigarettes that have gone through at least some sort of sensible safety check. The most commonly reported adverse events in our studies were throat and mouth irritation, headache, cough, and nausea. And interestingly, that's very similar to what you see with nicotine replacement therapy, especially if it's orally administered. And these tended to dissipate over time. When we looked at reductions in biomarkers and toxins and carcinogens, we found some studies where the reductions were from people switching from smoking to vaping, were consistent from those quitting smoking completely and not taking up e-cigarettes. And we didn't find any evidence coming out there looking like they were causing harm. In terms of implications for research, one of the great things about doing systematic reviews and particularly Cochrane reviews is that we write these implications for research. And then sometimes people write grant applications and cite our reviews. And then all of a sudden, two years later, we get to include that study in our review, which is wonderful. So we always really focus on this section because we know it can really shape evidence as it emerges. So we want to see more studies looking at cessation at six months or longer, and that's to address that issue with imprecision. Ideally, we really want to see studies using active comparators. Whether or not an e-cigarette works compared to nothing isn't particularly useful information. Everyone who's seeking support to stop smoking should be given some sort of support and ideally a pharmacological aid as well. So we'd like to see studies that compare nicotine e-cigarettes to other pharmacotherapies. We're building up an evidence base compared to nicotine replacement therapy, but so far we only have one very small study looking at it compared to varenicline. So ideally varenicline will become available again, and then there'll be more studies comparing nicotine e-cigarettes to varenicline. We want studies to assess the safety profile for as long as possible. So in an ideal world, these studies would keep following up their participants and be powered to detect differences in safety outcomes. Because serious adverse events are so rare, the reality is that studies that are 
power to look at, let's say, short-term cessation, have no hope of picking up any difference in serious adverse events because they're just very underpowered for that outcome. When we think about the way studies report their results, and generally when we talk about e-cigarettes and the safety of e-cigarettes, we think it's really important that safety is presented in both absolute and relative risk terms. So when we talk about the safety of e-cigarettes, it's very clear to say when we're comparing them to not using any form of nicotine or tobacco, or when we're comparing them to the risks of continuing to smoke tobacco. That is vitally important because important we know people are confused and uh, often slightly unclear about the evidence here. Ideally, and we know it's hard, we want studies to offer recent devices to participants as devices change all the time. Clearly that's a challenge, but what we should be aiming for is studies which are most representative of what's on the market at the time results are released, because that's how it's the most relevant to people who smoke who are thinking about switching. Data on pod type e-cigarettes are particularly lacking, but fortunately now we have two studies on that in our review, which is uh, a 200% increase from previously. And as with all research areas, protocols and statistical analysis plans need to be registered in advance and openly available. What we do when we do our reviews, if we find a study, we go back and we find its protocol. And if anything looks weird and if it's not doing what it said it was supposed to do, we'll consider that a risk of bias. So it's a really important part of our process to be able to know what the study authors plan to do in the first place. And also that they provide e-cigarettes ideally in a way that would be used in a real world setting. So these tightly controlled ones with a lot of, let's say, researcher input is not really gonna be replicated for the average person considering switching to an e-cigarette. We are seeing more and more studies which are trying to, to use real world settings a bit more, though obviously a real challenge if you're running a randomized controlled trial. And finally, our last major implication for research is that it is not the role of this review to look at what availability of e-cigarettes in a general population, including non-smokers does, but clearly that's a really important area for research. And so what we called for was further reviews using best available methods to evaluate the possible relationships between e-cigarette use and availability and youth uptake of e-cigarettes and conventional cigarettes. Um, so this is something we want to get into a bit more and really pleased to say that we have recently received funding from Cancer Research UK to do a new Cochrane review, which is looking at the relationship between the use and availability of e-cigarettes and tobacco smoking in young people. This is just in development, so we've kind of drafted an outline protocol, the investigators have a meeting about it in a couple of weeks, so it's very much what I'm presenting here is in no way finalized and totally open to hearing suggestions and ideas around this. But what we're hoping to do in this, in this area is include two types of data and really try and triangulate them. So one is data from longitudinal cohorts, which are looking at individual use trajectories from, let's say, being a never smoker to being a vapor to becoming a smoker etc. And the other is to look at population data through things like interrupted time series studies, instrumental variable studies, should they be published, and try and see where these two types of evidence might align and where there might be differences, and if there are differences, what might be driving those. Because if we have lots of evidence that e-cigarettes are on a pathway to smoking in young people, but then at the population level, we aren't seeing more young people smoking than we'd expect to, um, there are some questions there about how the two are aligning. Our main outcome is gonna be population rate of tobacco use in young people, but we're also interested in cessation uptake and progression of tobacco use in young people. And here by young people, we're meaning under 21 years old. And we're still deciding how we're gonna synthesize this. We have a number of people who are experts in other types of synthesis who are fortunately on board of this project. And so what we're thinking about doing, but we need to develop more, is thinking about developing causal chains a priori before we see the evidence and interrogate this using two methods, one being temporal qualitative comparative analysis and the other being framework synthesis. And one of the things we want to have a focus on too in this review is very specifically if there are differences in different socioeconomic groups. So that's something we're hoping to draw into our analysis if we have that data from the primary studies to think about, are these trajectories operating similarly across the socioeconomic spectrum or are we seeing different results in more and less disadvantaged populations, which is obviously critical to try and tackle uh, inequalities caused by tobacco use. So that was, though it took a while, still a whirlwind tour of what's in our latest review. And I'd really encourage you 
to see the full review for more detail on everything that I've presented, but also secondary outcomes, other comparisons, the data from the studies that didn't make it into those meta-analyses. And also we have a section where we compare it to other reviews in this area. And if you're interested in staying up to date, uh, information on our newest reviews, the briefing documents, the podcast can all be found at this website. Thanks very much and happy to take more questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Justin, do you have further discussion comments? Uh, sure, just a couple. So um, I think it's starting with uh, what you mentioned at the end, I think it's intriguing that you do plan this further review. Um, as you probably know, many TOPS audience members use quasi-experimental designs in particular, and I wonder what your opinion would be on selecting specifically for those sort of strong quasi-experimental designs um, that have more causal interpretations like uh, instrumental variables, which you mentioned, regression discontinuity, difference in difference designs. Um, you know, there are evidence syntheses that are done by your sister organization, the Campbell Collaboration, which focuses on social science studies, and they, those routinely do select for quasi-experiments. Um, so I, I do think that it's a feasible approach. Um, you know, one challenge would be how to screen the studies. And I know that the Cochrane Handbook um, has some guidance on that. And I'm actually pasting into the chat right now um, just a couple of um, references related to that. So like one would be trying to do it based on um, study design features. Another would be just using certain study designs. And I think um, both of those might be possible. Um, so I, I'd be curious what your further thoughts are on quasi experiments in particular. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what we will do when we meet as a group is think through, there's lots of guidance on this, not all the guidance agrees. So different review groups have different guidance, et cetera. But what I envisage us doing, and this could change, is thinking through essentially what our hierarchy would be um, in terms of the study designs we look at, being very clear on which ones we're gonna include and exclude from the CERCs. Otherwise I think you end up in very murky territory. But I think we will be in a situation where we decide and we state a priori that we're gonna favor certain study designs over others, particularly if they show different results, right? That there'll be some that we are more certain might represent uh, true causal effects than other study designs. So I think that is what we will do and we'll try and draw on evidence. There's also um, the EPOC Cochrane Group, which is the Effective Practice and Organization of Care Group, who often draw on non-randomized studies as well and have some guidance around those. Um, so we'll be looking to that. One of the real challenges for us is that there's not currently a one approved Cochrane tool for assessing risk of bias in these studies. Um, there's a Cochrane tool for non-randomized studies of interventions, but that's very much around interventions, whereas here what we're interested in mainly is exposures. Um, and some work was done to develop a tool by Cochrane on that, but it hasn't been finalized or signed off. So we're also in the process of trying to figure out how exactly we're going to critically appraise these studies in a way that's transparent um, and robust without clear guidance on exactly what we should be doing. Um, one criticism that I've uh, heard leveled against sort of the body of work that you uh, presented on e guys for smoking cessation is that the efficacy and real world effects could diverge in ways that you actually alluded to that in particular, you know, these efficacy studies, they don't address sort of how this increased access to e-cigarettes as a cessation aid might affect access to e-cigarettes among youth and maybe what, what those resultant outcomes are, um, which is not to minimize the importance of the efficacy studies, but, um, you know, they, they just weren't designed for, for to detect those sort of spillover effects. And so I think actually this is one important place where quasi-experimental studies could potentially contribute um, to our understanding. But I wonder if you sort of have more general thoughts about the question of efficacy versus real world effects as it applies to the studies that you covered. Yeah, I, it's a really important consideration. It's something that, as I mentioned, I think we hope to do more reviews. And so obviously this, this one in young people, but we'd also hope to eventually um, get funding for and do one looking at kind of population rate of tobacco use. Overall, one of the complexities about it, of course, is that it seems to me from the real world data we have, so we do have data from the UK using um, smoking toolkit study, which is a set of repeated cross-sectional surveys, which also have some longitudinal work embedded in them, that is suggesting that e-cigarette availability in the UK is helping people quit smoking and not influencing youth uptake. And of course, we have data from other countries that suggests differently. And when you get out of a controlled setting, you have so many complexities at play, which have to do with marketing, 
public health messaging, framing, various regulations and restrictions. So for example, in the UK, we have um, a cap on nicotine content. You know, e-cigarettes, it's a dual in the form it's used in the US, isn't available in the UK. So I think there are all of these other things that need to be considered. Um, and I think there's no one good definitive method to look at them. And that's where I'm a big fan of triangulation and saying, let's throw different methods at this. We're not sure what the best way to look at it is. Let's see, let's throw kind of all of our toolkit at this because it's an incredibly complex and important public health topic and see where we align and see where we don't and try and make sense of where that's that's coming from. Um, so yeah, I, I think we, e-cigarettes are tricky because I think some people think of them as a potential medication that would be available on prescription, in which case evaluating them in the same way as we evaluate other medicines feels very appropriately. If you're thinking of them as a consumer product, that feels much less appropriate. And what I'd say is that here in the UK, to some extent, what we or what some people think about is the example of snus. Um, so snus, which is used in Scandinavia primarily, is an oral tobacco product, which though not risk-free is less harmful than smoking. And when snus first came available in Scandinavia, there had to be some decisions here about whether or not we allowed snus on the market. We thought it's another tobacco product. Don't we wish we could just ban cigarettes? Don't we wish we could ban them before they ever came on the market? Let's go ahead and do that for snus. And what data has shown over time is that actually what we see, have seen is a real reduction in smoking prevalence and smoking related harm in Scandinavia, which seems to be driven by snus use. And the tricky thing about that is that we only know that because snus has been around for decades, right? We can only look at it now in hindsight and try and make sense of it. So what we're doing now is trying to make predictions ultimately based on short-term data because e-cigarettes haven't been around that long. They haven't been available for that long and the technology is constantly evolving. So I think what we need to do is, is be able to basically transparently present the evidence uh, say these are its limitations, but here it is. Try and make the best public health decisions you can. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, time for one uh, quick audience question. Uh, will there be a review of heated tobacco products at any point in the future? If so, when uh, might it take place? Yes, there will be. Um, I'm an author of it. I'm not leading it. It's being led by a colleague at UCL. So the protocol was published, I think, last year. Um, and the review is, we hope, about to go out for peer review. So my firm hope would be that it's out by early next year. Great. I'll send it over to Catherine then. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you, Dr. Hartman Boyce, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Thank you to the audience of 125 people for your participation. We hope you have a top-notch weekend.